Welcome to this episode of Rattling the Bars. I'm Eddie Conway coming to you from Baltimore for the Real News Network. We have been looking at the COVID-19 impact on prisoners around the country. We want to focus for a minute on what's happening here in Maryland. There's been reports that uh, the last official report we got was that there was 50 some cases uh, in the men's prison and over 30 some cases in the women's prison. So to kind of help us get an understanding of what's happening in the state, we are joined by Monica Cooper and Nicole Hansen and they both uh, lead organizations as part of a larger coalition that's addressing the issue of COVID-19 in the prison system. Uh, thanks for joining me, uh, Monica and Nicole. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Give me an overview of what's happening in the prison systems now. This is like in May. So what's the latest in terms of the numbers and in the terms of status. Uh, Nicole, can you kind of bring us up to date with that? To be honest with you, Eddie, in terms of the numbers, we're getting what, what the department is putting out, right? Um, but we know those numbers cannot be right. We know that there is no testing happening, especially uh, in the women's uh, facilities, both local and state. Um, so we just don't understand how uh, any numbers, any accurate numbers could, could, could come out if there is no testing happening uh, in, in either the women's local, local jails around the state um, and specifically in the women's uh, uh, state institution, which is uh, MCIW, which is the Maryland's only women's uh, prison. And so you know, unfortunately, all we know is that we get reports every day that women are showing signs, they're showing symptoms, and we know that the state institutions are um, then sending our women into what they're calling an infirmary. Um, we know that those infirmaries are not equipped with updated medical um, um, equipment or even updated medical staff. We know that that infirmary, and then a whole institution in general does not have uh, uh, medical personnel who are equipped to deal with such a pandemic. And so when you ask me uh, for numbers, uh, we, all we can do is use what, what we call participatory research and just report that every day, women are calling saying, my bump buddy just went to the infirmary. My bump buddy wasn't tested, I wasn't tested. We know that um, at this moment in the, in, the, in the women's state prison, they're not even allowed to call out. So we can't even get updated information about who even went out. We know that the only time that a woman is tested where they can account for any number is once they have to leave the institution. Um, so that's in the only way that our women can even leave the institution is if they've already shown all three signs of COVID and that their symptoms have gotten so worse that the department is, is afraid to let, you know, is afraid and so they call 911, they're not even using the normal protocols, which a correctional officer would then, you know, uh, drive somebody to the hospital. They are refusing to even be close to our, our women at this moment. And so those numbers are, are false because we know that no testing is happening in our institutions. Um, so we don't have you know, the updated numbers that we would like. I mean, all we have is um, women calling us every day. I think we, we get about five calls a day. I know at least I alone from the local women's detention center, I get about 15 to 25 calls a day from the women saying um, somebody in here is infected with COVID. They're not giving us the proper 
uh, masks or gloves, and they're just, you know, cramming us together and doing nothing. So that's all we have. Monica, you want to add something to that? Uh, one of the one of the things that that strikes me about this is because we're having problems finding those numbers. Also, is who's responsible for releasing those numbers, and uh, who can hold them accountable to to demand numbers? Monica, you want to first you want to jump in, and then either one of y'all can address the the responsibility angle. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I would think that the uh, Secretary Green, who is uh, uh, Rob Green, who is the, the Secretary of Corrections, would be the person who would be mainly held responsible for what those individual institutions do under his watch. And then if you want to go up the chain even higher, it would be Governor Hogan, because Governor Hogan uh, uh, has executive um office and the Department of Corrections and Public Safety falls under his uh, purview. So the highest on the chain, I believe, would be Governor Hogan. And then you would go to um, to Rob Green. Then you go to the next level, the individual wardens of that institution. A lot of them are giving lead way to try to address this COVID in a way in which they see fit. If an institution doesn't have a correctional staff, they can say, well, because we are short on staff, we're not going to give you showers. Or because we're short on staff, we're not going to do these things. But I had mentioned before, and um, this is not a knock on the unions at all, ask me or, or any representative of the union. But one of the things that I mentioned, one of the issues is that they are short on staff. And when you have a crisis or an emergency, no correctional staff should be able to take a day off because we need all hands on deck and everybody is uh, uh, fearful, full of anxiety. The correctional staff may have family members and loved ones at, at home and children that they care for and elderly parents they care for and the like. The people who are incarcerated have family members, friends and loved ones that also care about them and that's full of anxiety. But I do know that that is uh, part of the issue is, is the, the correctional staffing. And if I, if I can, you know, I'm reminded that during the Freddie Gray uprising, no officer was able to take a vacation day, uh, uh, um, any type of leave, all hands was on deck. And I believe that's one of the things that have to happen in corrections. And yeah, as, as Nicole stated, they are refusing to take women you know, out unless they have dead, which is at, it's, it's wrong. But in terms of who do you think that we can get to, to make them uh, spit that data out, then th those are the people who, who, in my mind, that you need to get to or call to say that we want transparency. We want to actually see the numbers. Because as Nicole said, if they were doing testing, we would see that the numbers are far higher. We shouldn't have to know about the numbers once somebody dies or once somebody is so severe that they are in a, um, in a hospital. It's clear that these women that they continue to put, put I'm, I'm gonna speak particularly about the women, but it's clear that men and women that they're putting in isolation should have been transferred to hospitals. But instead, what they're doing is when you show any signs, they throw you in isolation and leave you there. They peek on you. And if by some chance you look like you have dead, then they'll call 911. But when you start to show signs, testing is not even uh, something that they are, are considering, honestly. Uh, Nicole, what's, what's, uh, um because like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, both, both organizations that y'all represent are part of a larger uh, coalition. And I believe the ACLU is involved in that. Nicole, are they, are they in the position to actually call Green and get the actual numbers and keep an update? Uh, is anybody pressing them to do that? The people who are in the best position to get those numbers from Green are our state elected officials. This morning, they had a briefing today, right? Um, and we were told that some serious questions was asked at that briefing. But what we're gonna continue to do is get the, the information, the participatory information that we're getting from the institutions to our uh, judiciary committee. Because did you, it, what is apparent is that on Thursdays, the Department of Corrections meets with uh, the Judiciary Committee on a regular basis. And so what we're gonna do is get 
make sure that we are connecting with the elect elected officials, our allies on that committee, getting them the, the real live information that we're getting from the institutions. And I believe that they are the ones who are in the best position to ask Secretary Green for, for real data. But I will remind you, uh, Mr. Conway, that the Department of Re Corrections in Maryland has a real history of not reporting the real numbers. This is nothing new for the Department of Corrections. They, they put together a, a fancy uh, PowerPoint slide and they present it to the uh, elected officials. The elected officials will ask them questions and they are not held accountable. The Department of Corrections for decades have been allowed uh, to not uh, be accountable for the individuals in their institutions and what is happening in their institutions. And so I think um, this, is the, this is the time to continue to push on our state elected officials, specifically the ones who sit on the Judiciary and the Judicial Proceedings Committee in the Senate and force them to, to, to hold the department accountable and to tell them what they're doing. And we're not talking about fancy PowerPoints with colorful graphs. We want real numbers. We want real data especially on what's happening to our women because you know the men you know the department of corrections in, in many ways you know can, can get scared of the men they're, they're they're strong physically and build you know mentally the men will stick together um and the men will do what it takes to get what they want the women are are not as physically capable or you know mentally you know it's hard for women you know what I mean? And so the way that men will stand up inside an institution is not the same way that women will stand up in the institution. It happened at Dorsey Run. Dorsey Run, the men refused to allow them to bring in any more people in, that, in their dorm um, that was from another dorm that had signs of COVID. Those men stood up, they stood in front of that sally port and they refused to allow those corrections officers to usher in any more of the of, of incarcerated citizens. That's not the same in, a, in the women's institution, right? And so a light really needs to be shined on what is happening in the women's institution because they're not able to protect themselves in a way in which the men are, right? Um, our, our women are being held on 24 hour lockdown. At one point it was 23 and one, now it's 24 hour lockdown. Monica will tell you, the women who wanna call and tell what's happening are being targeted by the, by the, the, the warden. They've come to the, they, they, their cells and threatened to take away their good time if they keep reporting what is happening. And so that needs, you know, Monica said this weeks ago, um, somebody needs, to, we need to see what is happening in that institution. Other institutions are allowing um, Skype visits, right? So people can actually see their loved ones. They can see their family members. They can, they can feel that they're okay. They know that they're okay because they see them. The women are not allowed this. They can barely call us. Their, their mail is being monitored. And so we, we are requesting that our state, um, the house speaker, and the, 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 the Senate president do a real visit in, in that women's institution and not allow that war to, to lock down the institution and just walk them through, but make her take them to the infirmary, take them to the solitary unit and talk to our women and to find out what is actually happening behind those walls. Yeah, let and me do I, a follow-up. Okay, the last go thing ahead. I would say is, the governor issued a order for the nursing home to make sure that nursing homes were had testing, right? Our prisons are similar to the, to the structure of a nursing home. You have many people who are over the age of 60. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the close quarters are similar, you know, people living right next to each other. And so to order testing to our nursing homes, and not order testing to our prisons, which are similar and uh, physically similar, some similar 
in terms of the, the population of the people there, um, it really bothers, it really bothers us. What's the status in the local jails for women, the bail situation, the uh, uh, how are the judges treating people now that's, that's pending trial or uh, that kind of stuff? Do you have any information on how women are being treated on that level in this state, in the city? Um, I've been treated terrible. I've been working with uh, with Nicole and, and Out for Justice and fielding the calls for them. And um, I'm getting a pretty good idea about how things are, are functioning with the women over at, at Central Booking. And it seems that charges that would normally be considered a petty fight between a girlfriend and, and, and associates, they are holding them with no bail. I believe that the judges have taken a position the same as Governor Hogan, where his initial position was, we feel like the people who are incarcerated and locked up right now, they are safer inside. I believe that they are intentionally holding those people inside, knowing that they should be reconned, out on their own recon, or at least at home on home monitor, fighting their court cases. It's, um, yeah, and, and, it, and it's repetitious. It's the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. Some people over there for some technical VOPs, stuff that would normally had they would be home on that. So I believe mm -hmm. there is a um, like there are some judges that's deciding that we're going to keep them on the inside rather than allow them to go back out in a community. They're not going to have a, a lot of these um, cases are not even going to be heard until August and, and and later on in the year. So why not allow those women to be out of that environment where you lessen a chance? of them, you know, catching uh, COVID and spreading the disease. So that's one of the things that I um, ha had seen working with uh, Nicole and Out for Justice. Nicole, could you, uh, you mentioned during your last uh, answer uh, about women being punished for speaking out, losing their good time credit. Explain that, what happened? Do you have any direct information on people that should have been released? So, um, yeah, so in the state institutions, uh, they monitor their calls a lot, especially the women right now, because the local, I mean, the warden, warden Chippendale, she knows that she is not running her institution properly. She hasn't run that institution um, properly in the last 10 years. Um, and so she does not want her dirty laundry aired. And so the women who are calling uh, us, right? Monica got a call uh, from a woman, and then we were told that the, the warden came straight to that woman's cell and told her, you better stop lying over that phone. We can hear what you're saying. I have a woman right now um, that we have investigated and found out that they have taken 600 good days from her. Now she's one, she's a woman who has mental health issues. She's always asking to see a therapist. If you talk about that, you you know you you feeling like you want to kill yourself in the women's institution, you gotta write a letter stating that you want to kill yourself, and that is the way in which you will see somebody. We got a woman right now that we got documentation where the warden's information is on it that they took 600 good days from this woman, all from different little small issues. She complained that she wanted to see a therapist. She complained that she wanted to see a doctor. She complained that she didn't get her medicine. And so what they do with our loved ones that suffer from mental health issues, they throw them in a shoe and then they give them a ticket, okay? And we have, we have a similar situation where another woman was given the same infraction and they didn't even proceed with her case. And in fact, in order for her to come home, they went inside the system and gave this other lady her good days back. But this woman that we had, who has been sitting in jail for the last nine years on a parole, a parole violation, she got locked up with a, with a first degree assault. She violated probation on a technical because her urine was dirty. The judge gave her all her backup time. 
she has literally done almost eight years on a 10 or a nine year of parole violation. She could have been home. She is one of the people who needs to be home right now. But the department has taken away 600 or so good time credits from her, right? There are other cases where they're threatened if you keep saying stuff, if you keep saying things, we are, um, you're not going to come out for wreck. So this is what they're doing. They're putting, they're, they're imposing fear in our women. I haven't gotten a piece of mail from NCRW since this COVID crisis started. And as, and your listeners may not know, but my organization led the fight, or was a co-lead on a fight for women's pre-release. We ensured that the department had to um, fund a separate brick and mortar pre-release facility for women that had not been available to women for over 10 years. And so we always got constant, was getting constant communication from the women at the state prison. And since COVID has started, I have not received one letter, Eddie, from our women behind those walls. And so either nobody's working in the mail room, or they are re- they are not uh, sending these these women's letters to us. And on the local on the local side, though, uh, the women can write us. They let us know what's happening. Um, like Monica said, we found that that most of the women, specifically black and brown women, are given no bails for offenses that would otherwise, they would be home, able to fight their case, or even the charges would be uh, dismissed at the time of trial. We're even seeing sentencing disparities uh, at the local institution, right? You'll have one woman uh, being charged with armed robbery and carjacking, and another white woman being charged with unlawful use of a motor vehicle. The same situation, the women were taking drugs, They used the John's car. The John gave them the car, but they took too long to go get the drugs. So the John got scared and called the police and said that the car was stolen. Same scenario, a white woman is charged with a misdemeanor unlawful use of a motor vehicle where a black woman is charged with carjacking, armed robbery, and a host of other offenses. And so, you know, in one degree, we know that in Baltimore, police is typically charged up um, for black and brown folks and, and start at the lowest that they can for white folks. But then, then we have to also look at the state's attorney's office and see, now, and when you see these cases, now what are you going to do to ensure justice for our people? So we have been working closely with the state's attorney's office, pretrial, and the Office of Public Defender to urge them to use every tool in their toolbox um, that they can use to get our people home. Because even though the judge gives a no bail, our state's attorney, she has the ability to recall any warrant she wants, especially those low level offenses. Um, and she says that that's, that's what she's doing, right? She has the ability to not, um, uh, not object to the Office of Public Defenders or pretrials recommendations for release, she can do that. Her line attorneys can do that. When you think about pretrial, and I'm not at all a proponent for home detention. Home detention is another form of jail. It's still putting our people in cages. But unfortunately, this is the only option that our people are given to be free. And so instead of judges looking at the case and saying, oh, this person can go home on their own recon. These judges are only recommending home detention. And these are folks that we know are indigent. Right now, not a lot of people are able to go to work, right? So how are these judges expecting our our people to pay for home detention? And and we're hearing that you, the court may not start up until September, December, who knows? And so our loved ones are forced to have to figure out, do I get food or do I pay for my family to get free? Uh, Pre-trial can also 
uh, deem one eligible for the state's free home detention, right? So if you are indigent, the, the preacher of the state, you could go on the state's home detention. But what's happening here locally, Eddie, is that they, they're not working. It is often social workers and pre we only have one woman that's working in pretrial. Her name is Miss Boone. She's overloaded with these cases. So when the governor says, you know, urge the release, he should be backing that up with one, a timeline, and two, he should be putting some money in the budget to employ more state workers, like social workers, because those case workers are the ones who are gonna help to facilitate the release of people on the state level, right? And not just employing them, but giving them the proper medical equipment to make them feel safe to go in those institutions. They are, they are our loved ones too, right? The social workers, pre-child uh, folks, they are our loved ones. And if they don't feel safe, they're not gonna come to work. So the state needs to ensure that they got the proper medical equipment and make them feel safe to come in that institution and work. Because people have been sitting in jail for four and five weeks and the judge has already ordered them to come home. But the state does, has, don't, people are not working. They're not, they're refusing to come to work and go to the jails to interact with our loved ones. Um, and so we've been working with a group called Balk um, facilitating the the, uh, uh, the 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 fees for as many people as we can for home detention. Monica uh, MJP is helping us with fielding those calls and also uh, providing transportation to and from the home detention office, helping our loved ones go to and from the market, the family and friends of those incarcerated. Um, so this is this is a disaster. It's a nightmare. And what is what COVID has exposed is is all of the things that we knew about the system. You know, Eddie, you talk about it all the time. You know about the system, and so I know I'm not saying anything that you don't already know. But what COVID has really done is really, uh, really opened up, um, just kind of lifted the blinds on the penal system, and show how screwed up, how unorganized and how dysfunctional uh, the system is. And, it's, and it is really impacting our black and brown women in ways that you all can't even imagine. That uh, brings me to my next question. Monica, what, what are the unique problems for women uh, in the prison system and in, in the local jails? Uh, are you aware, are there pregnant women in there that's at high risk? Uh, ex exactly what, what are their risk factors and who's at the most risk? May the 23rd down, we, we're going to be in the Jessup area. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, participate in this caravan of freedom. We want every and anybody to come down there. We have a flyer that has a list of things that we would like to see that we know that will help the people on the inside. One, we demand testing for everybody. The, the staff, as well as the people inside, we, de we demand transparency. Women over 60 should be released. People with underlying conditions should be released. And if you're minimum pre-release status, you really should be released. So we have a whole list of demands there, and that's going to be Saturday, May 23rd at 2 p.m. down at uh, down in the Jessup region. And I'll make sure that you guys have that um, flyer so people who are listening can also uh, participate. In terms of uh, pregnant women, there's always some woman or some women that are pregnant that are behind the walls. I don't necessarily have all those numbers. We have a colleague, uh, Kim Haven, that we work with that work more with the uh, pregnant population. But I will say that um, besides women that are pregnant, some of the most vulnerable are women like Barbara Hampton. Barbara Hampton has stage four cancer. Barbara Hampton has had her commutation papers on Governor Hogan's desk for about three years. We have been in there for 42 years, 60 years of age, just trying to recover from COVID. She was so bad off that they had to rush her to the hospital, 911. She's vulnerable. She's been there 42 years. It's time. We have all these elderly and now aging, the aging population. We just had a brother that just passed away after being inside for 38 years. He died. 
He yes. just recently died. Yes, Parker so we have no. yeah. Okay. So we have people who are and should be deemed eligible for relief. Okay, it's not we're, make we are almost out of time here. Addie, we do have a pregnant woman that's over at the local jail. We forwarded oh. that information oh. to Kim. So we'll okay. get that to you. But we have we okay. have some reports of pregnant. Women. Okay, and we'll come back and revisit this next week because we need to follow up on this and find out what's what's going on still, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you both for joining me. Thank you for joining this episode of Rattling the Bars for the Real News Network.